Hello everyone, I'm Happy Caldwell and welcome to today's edition of Arkansas Live. We've been teaching on how to live in the overflow all week long. We're going to continue with that today, so stay tuned. Again, I say, some people are thinking, what are you talking about, overflow? Don't you know what's going on out there? Yes, I do. But we have a model in the scriptures called the land of Goshen. They lived in the overflow when all around them was death, doom, disparity, famine, all the kind of things that we're experiencing right now in our culture today. So it is possible to live in the overflow. But you've got to start thinking overflow. You can't think shortage, lack, sickness, disease. You've got to stop thinking the negative and start thinking the positive of the Word of God. I'm not talking about mind over matter. I'm not talking about mental gymnastics. I'm not talking about a positive mental attitude. I'm talking about the Scriptures, the Bible. We can live in the overflow. And I was, uh, yesterday I started establishing overflow in the Bible. Genesis 1, 26 through 28, God said, I will give you every seeding seed to you it be for plenty, plenty, more than enough, more than is needed, overflow. And then you found out in Genesis 26 where God told Isaac to sow in that land of famine. No matter what's going on around you, you don't stop sowing. And it says that God blessed him with a hundredfold. So he continued to go uh, to overflow. And then you go over to, uh, let's see, let's go over to John chapter 10, 10, a very familiar passage of scripture. The thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But I am come, Jesus said, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So that's overflow. Jesus encouraged us and expected us to live and to experience Overflow, plenty, more than is adequate, more than is necessary to have abundance, excess, excessiveness. Uh, go over to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly, there it is again, exceeding abundantly, exceeding abundantly, overflow, more than enough. Uh, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. This is the instruction of God in Genesis, demonstration in Isaac, Genesis 26. Uh, this is the instruction of Jesus himself uh, to have life more abundantly. And now the apostle Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, and he said, you can have exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. I did a uh, minister's conference uh, a few days ago, uh, maybe a few weeks ago now. And um, it was uh, an opportunity to teach this living in the overflow. In fact, that was the theme of the conference. And I, I taught what I'm teaching you, but Pat Harrison, Kenneth Hagin's daughter, uh, I told her, I said, you know, Pat, you have... Uh, a legacy, a heritage of living in the overflow of the Spirit. And that's what she taught on. Well, I remember Dr. Lester Summerall telling me in the beginning of our relationship, which was for several years, he was in his maybe late 70s, early 80s. And he told me, he said, you know, I, uh, I preach out of the overflow. I said, what, what do you mean by that? He says, well, I spent the first 50 years of my life taking in, in the Word of God, in the Spirit. I spent the first 50 years of my life studying to show myself approved unto God. Now, he didn't say it exactly that way, but he was saying, I spent the first half of my life, 50 years of my life about, because he lived into his 90s. Uh, he said, I spent the first part of my life taking in, learning, studying, he said, and now in the latter part of my life, I preach out of the overflow. I preach out of the overflow of the Spirit. Uh, I allow the Holy Spirit to bring back. And that's what Jesus said in John 14, 16, uh, John 16, 
chapter 14 and chapter 16, he said the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, will bring things to your remembrance. He will show you things to come. He will bring to your remembrance whatever things I have said unto you. So the Holy Spirit is there to bring out from you, and I do that a lot here with you on Arkansas Live. I teach out of the overflow of what he has put in me all these years, over the years, because it's in me. In fact, I've shared this with you before. My little proverb is what I call it. God said, what you know, you know. What you think you know, you don't. And what you don't know, you will. So I share with you out of the abundance, the overflow of the Spirit, of what I know. <laughs> and I'm not saying I know a whole lot, but I know more than I did when I started uh, uh, almost 50 years ago in, in the ministry in 1973. So I know <clears throat> more than I did then. And I've learned a lot in, in I see, that would be f at this particular time, 48 years uh, going on 50 in a couple of years. I, I know now uh, <clears throat> I'm preaching and teaching out of the overflow things that I've learned. And I've noticed this, and I so appreciate the Holy Spirit. I, I get revelation from him uh, about things that I didn't know. And that fits right in with the thing that he told me. He said, what you don't know, you will. He's revealing things to me that I heard and that hearing, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And that revelation stayed with me in my spirit and renewed my mind. And now he's bringing it out, which is of a great benefit to me. And I trust to you also. So here are scriptures that deal with excess, deal with more than is enough. In Malachi 3, 10 and 11, it says, Bring the tithes into the storehouse, and I'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing upon you. There'll not be room enough to receive it. That's all overflow. In 1 Kings 17, there are several examples in Kings with the prophets Elijah and Elisha. And there was one example where um, uh, the woman, the widow woman, had a, uh, a need and the prophet stopped by and said, what are you getting ready to do? She said, well, there's famine. And said, I'm getting ready. We have a little cruise of oil and, and a little flour, and I'm getting ready to make a, a cake and eat it and die. <laughs> I've always, that always puzzled me because if, if there's famine and there's no food and there's nothing and you've got a cake and a little oil and you're going to eat it and die, um, why eat it? I mean, just die. If, if that's the only thing between you and death, <laughs> de departure of this earth, <laughs> departure of this life, cessation, if, if that's all there is to it, why bother? I mean, you know, you, well, you just going to die on a full stomach instead of an empty one? Uh, what's the difference? Well, that's not mine to decide, but it's, it's humorous to me. Okay. And so the, the prophet told the woman, said, oh, oh, oh wait a minute, don't, don't eat it and die. Make me a little cake first and give it to me. Whew, boy, would the media have a time with that. Prophet takes the last morsel out of the widow woman's mouth. But no, God had a plan. And so she did. And he told her, he said, go get all of the vessels that you can find and, you know, fill them up. And she did. And she, he said, only, <clears throat> only stop. Don't get a few. Get all you can. Uh, it'll only stop when you run out of vessels. So her obedience to the prophet of God, the oil started flowing until all of her pots were full. She had overflow. She lived on that through that time of famine in overflow because she obeyed the prophet. Now go over to Proverbs 11, 24. And then I want to get uh, over to Genesis and talk to you about uh, living in the land of Goshen. Okay, Proverbs eleven twenty four. 24. Let me find it here. Psalms, Proverbs 11, 
and let's look at verse 24. There is that scattereth, and it increases. And there is that withholdeth more than is fitting, and it tends to poverty. If you withhold, it tends to poverty. But it, he said the liberal soul, um, the soul of blessing, shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. Now, there's a surplus here. There's overflow here. If you give, if you withhold more than is fitting, it tends to poverty. Because usually you withhold when there's fear. Fear that you're not going to have enough. And again, I say I've repeated myself several times so you wouldn't misunderstand. There's nothing wrong with having provision. There's nothing wrong with protection for your family. There's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, it, uh, carrying uh, uh, extra gasoline in your truck or car or whatever in case you run out. There's nothing wrong with having extra food in the freezer and in the st store. It, it's only wrong when you do it for fear. It's only wrong when you store up things for fear that you're not going to have enough. But there's nothing wrong with being prepared. Luke 6, 38 says, Give, and it shall be given to you. Now watch this. I'm talking about living in the overflow. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. And if you've ever raked leaves in the fall, and the Lord used this as an example, because as a kid I was always having to rake the leaves in our yard. That was my job uh, during the fall leaf time. And uh, we used to love to play in the leaves. I mean, we'd rake them up, leaves in a big pile. And my sister and I and our dog, Honey, she was a collie, a beautiful honey-colored collie. That was our playground. That was what we did. We raked the leaves up in a pile, and then we'd dive in them, jump in them, roll around in them. The dog would jump on us. I mean... That was a fun time as a kid growing up. But when I had to start stuffing them in the bag, now we didn't have a disposal like you have today. Uh, I didn't know anybody that did lawn care business. <laughs> I was the lawn care business. Uh, Daddy said, you can cut the grass, you can rake the leaves, etc. But I noticed <clears throat> to get more leaves in the bag, you had to press them down. And in Luke 6, 38, it says, Give, and it will be given unto you. Press down, good measure, shaken together, and running over. But you put all the, you had to stomp them down in that barrel or the bag and get as many as you could in there and, and then tie them up or put the lid or burn them or whatever. But if you get as many leaves as you can in that bag and stomp them down and squeeze them together, that bag is tight. But if you open that mouth of that bag, take that little tie off of it and squeeze at the bottom, phew, they all come out. Running over shall men give into your bosom. That is overflow. That is overflow. And you are to be living in the overflow. So I just wanted to uh, substantiate here <clears throat> all these scriptures refer to living in the overflow. Uh, you have to first establish, if you're going to believe something, you have to first establish and, you know, um, make sure that it's in the Word of God. You can't manipulate the Scriptures. The Bible says there's no Scripture that any private interpretation. Uh, let's, let's look at uh, one more uh, verse in Job. Uh, Job chapter 1. And let's go to... <clears throat> verse 1, then verses 3 and 10. Job 1. You, uh, you might be thinking, well, you're certainly not going to find any example of overflow in Job. Uh, Job is a story of suffering. No, suffering occurred, but that's not the story. The story of Job is a story of faith. But I want you to see how he started in the beginning. There was a man in the land of Uts whose name was Job. And the man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and shunned evil. 
There were born unto him seven sons, three daughters. His substance was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men in the east, or it says the sons of the east. In other words, Job was a prosperous man. I mean, he had herds that were, you know, unheard of. They were, he was a wealthy man. If you had, if you had herds of anything, cattle, sheep, oxen, whatever, and you had wells, if you had wells and herds, you were considered a rich man. You were considered a wealthy man. Now, uh, <clears throat> it says he was the greatest of all the men in the East. Okay, if you divide up the world in four sections, uh, it says he owned one-fourth of all the world in that time. And verse 10 it says, now this is Satan's accusation against him. Has you not made a hedge about him? Now this is Satan accusing him to God. And about his house and about all that he has on every side, you have blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. The word increased there, his cattle, his possessions. Everything is increasing. Now, I want us to go over to Genesis now, and I want us to start this little, uh, this trek, this uh, understanding uh, of the land of Goshen, because I want you to see and compare living in the overflow with living in the land of Goshen. My grandmother, born in 1893, Used to, she lived to be 93 years old. She used to say always, at some point in our family gatherings, land of Goshen. It was either an exclamation after hearing some news or hearing somebody talk, or she would always, just, it just kind of a southern colloquial slang, she would always say, land of Goshen, land of Goshen. Uh, other terms like, my goodness, or Lord have mercy. It was, hers was land of Goshen. I don't know that she knew what she was saying. I certainly didn't until after I got saved. And at one time as a pastor of our church, I decided I would investigate that. What is the land of Goshen? And what does that mean? And the Lord told me to look it up and do a study on it. So that's what I did. And that's what I'm going to share with you today and tomorrow. So I want you to be sure and stay tuned. If you got your Bible there, notes, take notes. Genesis 37, and let's look at um, Joseph's dream. First of all, let's read verse 3. Genesis 37, 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. He made him a coat of many colors. Now <laughs> this is not the same coat of many colors that Dolly Parton sings about. The marginal reference says this coat of many colors was an emblem of royalty and position. So this was a special garment, handmade. It was like an ambassador. It was like a king or a prince or something. It was, it was not just a bunch of old rags or skin sewed together. This was a coat of an emblem of royalty or position. If you saw Joseph wearing that coat, you knew he was somebody in that, in that time. He was, he was some, some important person. Uh, then in verse 8, and uh, excuse me, verse 5, it says, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Why did they hate him? Because... He said, here's my dream. We were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. 
And his brethren said to him, You are not going to reign over us, and you will not indeed have dominion over us. And they hated him for the more, for his dreams and for his words. Sounds just like brothers and sisters. You're not my boss. You can't tell me what to do. Well, they were angry at his dream because his dream represented something. And he dreamed another dream and told it to his brethren. You thought he'd have learned his lesson. And he told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And this dream, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and his brethren and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow down ourselves to you, to the earth? And his, brother, his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. The father was not so quick to condemn him. Now, and you go on down to verse 18. When his brothers saw Joseph afar off and he came near to them, they conspired against him to slay him. I mean, this was an extreme dysfunctional family as far as this is concerned. They were going to kill him. And uh, come now, therefore, and let us slay him, cast him into a pit, and we'll say some evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Well, in the first place, this was not Joseph's dream. This was God's dream, an instruction to Joseph for a purpose and a season. Keep in mind, we're talking about living in the overflow living in the land of Goshen. This is a model, an example. Uh, okay, uh, Reuben heard it, and he said, um, let's don't kill him. He, he took Joseph. And Reuben said, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that's in the wilderness. Lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. So Reuben had an intention there to save him and take him back to his father. And it came to pass when Joseph was come uh, unto his brethren, they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors, and they took him, verse 24, cast him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, and a company of, company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it to Egypt. And Judah said to his brethren, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let's sell him <laughs> to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And uh, his brothers were content. So there passed the Midianites, the merchantmen. They drew up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they bought Joseph, uh, excuse me, brought Joseph into Egypt, and, return, and Reuben returned to the pit. Behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. So here is the story of Joseph having a dream from God. His brothers didn't like it, and it tells you later what the, the dream was, and uh, it it affected uh, the whole uh, land of Israel and affected all of the, the people. There was famine. There were going to be seven years of famine, seven years of earring, seven years of famine. And, and God told uh, Joseph what to do to protect his people. Now, this was not going to affect everybody. It, this was just for Joseph and his family. And then you go on down to verse 36. And the Midianites sold Joseph into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer, a court official, an officer of Pharaoh's, and captain of the guard, or chief executioner. Now, there's, there's where we're going to leave Joseph. We've got a couple of minutes left. We're going to leave Joseph. He's in Potiphar's household, and, uh, and go over to chapter 39, Genesis 39. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. 
And his master saw that the Lord was with Joseph, that the Lord made all he did to prosper in the land. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put his hand to do. So here now, Joseph is promoted. He prospers and they discern that the Lord's blessing was upon Joseph. And it definitely was. And so Joseph became, became second in command uh, only to uh, Potiphar. And then he goes on in 39 and says that the, he, uh, the Lord made all that he did uh, to prosper. And while he was in Joseph's house, uh, Joseph's wife uh, enticed him and threatened him. And she lied about him and said he tried to rape her. He was put in prison. And all of these things were against him. There's famine in the land. Joseph has been accused of attempted rape. And, and God's uh, mercy and prosperity was on him. Uh, then you go over to, uh, let's see, let's go over to um, let's go over to verse 44, chapter 41. Uh, well, let's go to let's go to verse 29. Behold, there came seven years of great plenty throughout the land of Egypt, and uh, then uh, there were seven years of famine. And all the plenty was forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine was consuming the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of the famine following was very grievous. Similar to what we're experiencing right now here. And the dream doubled in, unto Pharaoh twice. And it was established by God. And God will shortly bring it to pass. So down in uh, verse 34 and we're not going to have time to read this, so we'll have to read it tomorrow. It says, uh, Pharaoh says, uh, or, or Joseph told Pharaoh, uh, God's going to take care of us, but we're going to have to give the fifth part of the land uh, seven plenteous years, and the food shall be for store, and et cetera. I'm going to stop there for today. We'll pick this up tomorrow because this is the power pack of the land of Goshen living in the overflow. Jesus is Lord of our Arkansas and wherever you're watching in the world. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas 72221 or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at Happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at VTNTV.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com.